Hello, hello! Welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British rail critics, and of course, my underwater train finders. You are the reason why this content remains legendary. I'm not quite at that tier yet, but I hope to be someday. And today, we are going to discuss the Doolittle Raid. Yes, this is arguably one of the most famous bombing runs from World War II, and it happened right after the United States actually ended the war. It's a fairly well-known story, but it is also kind of one of my favorites, so I wanted to talk about it. This is the story of the Doolittle Raid. The Doolittle Raid is also known as the Tokyo Raid, and it was an air raid that was conducted by the United States on the Japanese capital of Tokyo, as well as some other areas, on April 18th, 1942. It was the first air operation that actually hit the Japanese home islands, and it was an incredibly brave and daring undertaking carried out by both the United States airmen that were involved and our Chinese allies that helped them afterwards. The raid sort of came into being out of a request from President Franklin D. Roosevelt. He was speaking to the Joint Chiefs of Staff on the 21st of December 1941. That was only a few weeks after Pearl Harbor. Roosevelt wanted Japan itself bombed as soon as possible because, well, they bombed us. Listen, you started it. But Roosevelt was looking for a morale booster. Pearl Harbor had a few effects. One of them was, of course, a significant upsurge in enlistment in general, as people were genuinely furious that our country had been attacked. But there was also a morale issue in the general populace. People were afraid because the attack had happened. The Japanese had managed to bomb a significant naval port in a place that was considered part of the United States. It may not be the continental United States, but it was close enough to raise alarm for people. Roosevelt not only wanted the raid to be carried out as a morale booster for the general populace, but also to make it very clear to the Japanese that we were not messing around. You don't just get to sneak attack the United States and not pay for it. That's not happening. The initial concept for the attack actually came from Navy Captain Francis S. Lowe. He was the Assistant Chief of Staff for Anti-Submarine Warfare. He spoke with Admiral Ernest J. King on January 10, 1942, about the possibility of utilizing twin-engined army bombers, but launched from an aircraft carrier. It was a new concept at the time, and a rather weird one. The bombers that the military was using were not designed to take off from aircraft carriers, but the military was interested in the possibility of it. Jimmy Doolittle was a famous military test pilot, as well as a civilian aviator and aeronautical engineer before the war. And this is where he enters the story, as he was assigned to the Army Air Force's headquarters specifically to plan the raid, based off of his own expertise. The bombers that were going to be used for this had to be really specific. They had to make sure they got everything just so. Because not only did they have to take off from an aircraft carrier, but they would still have to fly a very significant distance over hostile territory and hopefully land in allied China. They would need a cruising range of 2,400 nautical miles. That's about 4,400 kilometers, and they'd have to do it with a 2,000-pound bomb load. Doolittle considered a variety of different bombers for the possible role. He was stuck with twin engines, as they were large enough to be bombers, but still small enough to actually fit on the aircraft carrier. Doolittle considered the Martin B-26 Marauder, the Douglas B-18 Bolo, and the Douglas B-23 Dragon. But he rejected all of these. The Marauders had questionable takeoff characteristics when they were looking at a carrier deck, and both the Bolos and the Dragons had larger wingspans than the other twin-engine bombers that the United States had, the B-25s. That would reduce the number of those that could actually be put on the carrier, so he went with the B-25B Mitchell. B-25s are very, very, very good bombers, but they're often overshadowed by the more famous B-17s and the B-29s. But they were excellent in their own right, though at this point they'd actually never been used in combat before. And they certainly were never intended to take off from a carrier of all things. But tests that had been conducted with the aircraft proved that they could actually fulfill the mission's requirements. As for where they were going to land, well like I said, it wound up landing in Allied China. But originally they wanted to land closer in Vladivostok, which is in Soviet territory. 
But at the time, the Soviet Union had a neutrality pact with Japan. They had signed that in April of 1941, and they weren't willing to risk that to help us out, and they denied us permission. But China had already been at war with Japan for some time. So they wound up not being that difficult to convince to lend us their aid when they found out we were going to be bombing, you know, Japan, who had been massacring their people for a number of years. Like, they were over it. You're going to bomb Japan? Absolutely. The plan was that the bombers would actually land at five possible airfields in China, be refueled, and then fly to Chongqing. And they were going to be doing this solo. Once they took off in the carrier, they were alone. It was common practice to have escort fighters go with bombers on missions, but fighters couldn't go as far as bombers could. Given this distance was already taxing on the bombers, fighters just weren't going to happen. The B-25 went through rigorous testing on board USS Hornet to make sure that, yeah, they could take off. And, yeah, they could. Hornet had enough space to allow them to get up to take off speed. It was close, but they could do it. The squadron that was assigned the mission was the 17th Bombardment Group. They'd been the first group of bomber crews to actually receive B-25s, and as a result had the most experience flying them. But they were only taken on a volunteer basis, and they weren't told exactly what the mission was at first because the whole thing was very top secret, only that it was extremely dangerous, which is really fun military code for suicide mission. This was so risky on so many levels. Again, the bombers were traveling a distance that they just weren't built for, taking off from a runway they weren't built for, over a hostile and heavily defended country that had made it abundantly clear that it wanted war with us. But they had plenty of volunteers, eager to fill out the 16 aircraft they wound up using. They originally wanted more than that, but for a variety of reasons they had to reduce it to 15. And then they wound up with an extra one, so they sent off 16. The B-25Bs were heavily modified for the mission because, to, by default, they just weren't going to be able to do it. First of all, their weight had to be reduced a bit. This included the removal of their lower gun turret, the removal of their liaison radio, and the replacement of the Norden bombsite with a makeshift aiming site that was called the Mark Twain. It was so cheap and light that the materials for it only cost 20 cents. In 1942 money, but still, that was a very cheap bombsite. They had some new equipment installed too. De-icers and anti-icers, steel blast plates put on the fuselage around the upper turret, as well as the installation of a 160-gallon collapsible neoprene auxiliary fuel tank. This was fixed to the top of the bomb bay, and was in addition to the installation of support mounts for additional fuel cells in the bomb bay, crawlway, and lower turret area. This was all, of course, to increase fuel capacity. They also added mock gun barrels in the tail cone. Not actual guns, no, 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 no. They just added mock ones to make attacking fighters think they were guns. Because they couldn't actually afford to put heavy guns back there. The crews that were selected trained for three weeks. In simulated carrier deck takeoffs, low level and night flying, low altitude bombing, and over water navigation. Doolittle was confident in the crews, they had trained very well, and he considered them safely operable. But no matter how much training they received, the mission was still going to be incredibly risky. The main target of the mission was Tokyo, and in fact 10 of the B-25s would be bombing targets there. Two would wind up bombing Yokohama, two were bombing Nagoya, one was bombing Yokosuka, and one was bombing Kobe. Like I said, there were 16 modified B-25Bs involved, each with five-man crews, as well as additional army maintenance personnel. They were all loaded on the carrier USS Hornet, and this amounted to a total of 71 officers and 130 enlisted men. USS Hornet and the B-25s would be traveling with Task Force 18, departing from San Francisco Bay at 8.48 on the 2nd of April. Hornet wound up meeting up with Task Force 16, which was commanded by Vice Admiral William F. Halsey Jr., it had arguably one of the most famous U.S. carriers in history, USS Enterprise, as well as a number of escort cruisers and destroyers. The combined force included both carriers, three heavy cruisers, one light cruiser, eight destroyers, as well as two fleet oilers. Because of the need for operational secrecy, given how deep they were going to be penetrating into Japanese waters just to launch the bombers, radio silence was paramount. Eventually, on the 17th of April, the oilers, which were naturally slower, refueled the task force and then withdrew with the destroyers to the east, while the carriers and the cruisers kept moving west at about 20 knots, 37 kilometers an hour or 23 miles per hour. The intended launch point was just east of Japan itself, 
But just the next morning, on the 18th of April, the task force wound up being spotted by a Japanese picket boat number 23, Nitomoru. They were able to radio a warning about the attack to Japan, and then the boat was sunk by USS Nashville. Doolittle and Hornet skipper captain Mark Mitscher conferred about the loss of operational secrecy, and decided that they would have to launch the B-25s immediately. By this point in the raid, it was 10 hours early, and 170 nautical miles, 310 kilometers or 200 miles, farther from Japan than planned. That would significantly cut into the B-25's fuel reserves, which even on plan were incredibly taxed. But they didn't have a choice. They were way too far behind enemy lines to risk being attacked before they launched the bombers. So up the pilots went. This included Doolittle himself. Though they had trained heavily for the situation of taking off from a carrier, none of the pilots had actually done that specific thing just yet. It was a do or die situation, either they did it or they fell into the ocean. But amazingly, every single one of them did make it up. The only one who seemed to struggle was Doolittle himself, interestingly. He almost hit the water before he pulled up at the last second. The B-25s flew in formation for the first part of the trip, but then split up to fly singly, very low, wave top level, to avoid detection. It worked, and they began arriving over Japan about noon Tokyo time, which was six hours after they first launched. The B-25s were able to drop their ordnance without much of an issue, although a few did see some resistance. Some light anti-aircraft fire, as well as an attack by a few enemy fighters. One did take a few minor hits from anti-aircraft fire, and one unfortunately had to jettison its bombs before reaching the target, because it came under attack by fighters after its gun turret malfunctioned and needed to be lighter to do evasive maneuvers. It was claimed that the Americans managed to shoot down three Japanese fighters during the exchange, and apparently those mock gun turrets in the back that didn't actually fire, like I said, totally worked. The enemy fighters did not attempt to attack the B-25s from the rear. They managed to keep making their way on course southwest across the East China Sea. But one of the B-25s, which was piloted by Captain Edward J. York, wound up being extremely low on fuel, much worse than the others. So he made the bold decision to instead make for the Soviet Union, which again was much closer, though he wasn't actually supposed to go there. But it was a better option than being forced to ditch in the middle of the ocean. The airfields in China were supposed to be ready for them, and should have had homing beacons to bring them in, but Halsey, back with the task force, had never actually sent the signal to alert them, because they were worried that there'd be a threat to the task force. Speaking of the ships, since this was going to be a one-way trip for the bombers, as soon as they launched, yeah, they got the heck out of Dodge. That's fair. Besides York's B-25, the others all made their way towards China, but they actually would never have made it, if not for the fact that they were lucky and had a bit of a tailwind when they came off their target. This increased their ground speed by about 25 knots. It was a boost they needed to at least reach land, but the fuel was running out. They knew they could not make it to the intended bases. They would either have to bail out or crash land. After 13 hours in the air, they reached the Chinese coast and did, well, one of those two things. At least one was killed during the bailout attempts, and the airmen had to seek help from friendly Chinese military or even civilians. The Chinese hated the Japanese at this point in history, so they were willing to help them, and many were able to be hidden and sent to a place of relative safety so they could be returned to the United States later. This mission was the longest one ever flown in combat by the B-25 Mitchell. They managed to average about 2,250 nautical miles, which is about 4,170 kilometers. When all was said and done, 10 men were considered missing. And as for Captain Edward York, who made his way towards the Soviet Union, well, he did land about 40 miles beyond Vladivostok. And like I said, the USSR at the time had a neutrality pact with Japan. That doesn't mean that they turned them in to the Japanese. No, 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 no. They were simply unable to immediately repatriate any Allied personnel involved in such hostilities. So the crew was interned, and the B-25 was impounded. The U.S. did send official requests for their release, but this was denied, at least at the time. Though, for what it's worth, York would later say that the Soviets actually treated him and his crew very well. And several months later, they were actually relocated and allowed to return back to their side, May of 1943. A cover story had been concocted saying that they'd actually escaped using the help from a smuggler. This story was a complete load, 
that was made up by the NKVD to mask the fact that they had actually let them go. You let those airmen go? I can't believe you would do this. What? No, 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 no. We, we, we didn't let them go. They, they escaped the gulag. I, I, I cannot believe it myself. To think those dastardly capitalist imperialist dogs would be able to escape my comrades here in Soviet Russia. They really escaped from you. That's really what happened. Yes, of course, of course. That's exactly what happened. Trust me. Do you think I would lie? <laughs> Oh, Stalin does not lie. Stalin tells truth and sends hearer of truth to Gulag. Speaking of truth, knock knock. Who's there? The NKVD. The NKVD who they will ask the questions. As for the ten members of the raiding party that were missing, two more revealed to be killed in action. That left eight unaccounted for, and it was discovered that they had actually been captured. Their fate was not fully known until 1946. The Japanese did not take the attack very well, and they were treated terribly under their custody. Originally, they were all sentenced to death, and they were transported back to Tokyo where the army ministry reviewed their case. Five of those sentences were actually commuted, three of them were executed. Those that were allowed to live didn't live very well. They were given a starvation diet, and their health was rapidly falling apart. One of them died by December of 1943, and the remaining four were given slightly better treatment later in the war, but still weren't very well off. They were finally freed by American troops in August of 1945 after the war ended, and four Japanese officers that were involved with their treatment were actually tried for war crimes. They were sentenced to hard labor, three of them for five years and one for nine years. One of the raiders who had been liberated, Barr, had been near death when he was saved. He seemed like he wound up having it worse off mentally, too. He probably had what we would call now post-traumatic stress disorder, and he became suicidal. Doolittle wound up personally intervening with his treatment and made sure that he would recover. The Chinese who were found to be aiding the Doolittle raiders were also not treated well at all. Japan launched the Xinjiang Jingzi campaign, also known as Operation Saigo. It was specifically to prevent eastern coastal provinces of China being used for such an attack again, and to take revenge on the Chinese people. An area of some 20,000 square miles was laid waste, completely destroyed by Japanese invaders. People who were found to have been aiding the Doolittle Raiders were tortured before they were killed, and many young girls and grown women, well, I can't actually say what they did to them, without YouTube possibly yelling at me, but I think most of you can use your imagination. But the Japanese were furious about the raid, and with legitimate reason because it had been successful in the intended purpose. The raid didn't actually do that much physical damage, but that wasn't necessarily the point. The Japanese military at the time was bolstering the populace by saying how invincible they were and how they'll protect Japan and all this, and all of a sudden a bunch of American bombers drop heavy explosives on them. Like, what? It demoralized the Japanese and made the military rethink their entire strategy. They put a lot of plans into overdrive as a result, realizing that the Americans could, in fact, hit their homeland. And as far as the United States was concerned, well, it worked there too. The two little raiders were hailed as heroes, and all the people, civilian and military alike, had a significant morale boost with the success of the raid. Doolittle himself was given the Medal of Honor by President Roosevelt in 1942 and all 80 of the raiders were given the Distinguished Flying Cross. The Chinese also saw fit to decorate the raiders for their efforts, too. And a lot of them still continued to serve throughout the rest of the war, including Doolittle himself, who got a two-rank promotion. The raid in general was, again, one of the most famous tales from World War II on the American side. A lot of people thought it wasn't even going to be possible, especially given the circumstances they were dealing with at the time. But they still pulled it off, and the vast majority of them survived. Those on the Doolittle Raid held an annual reunion almost every year from the late 40s to 2013. There were a ton of various monuments and pieces and museums honoring what they did. And on April 9th, 2019, the final Doolittle Raider passed away of natural causes. His name was Lieutenant Colonel Richard E. Cole, and he was 103 years old. And he was Doolittle's co-pilot in aircraft number one. And despite the fact that they're all gone now, 
resting in peace in a better place than this, I think we can all agree that those legends will never be forgotten. And with that, a special thank you to all my underwater train finders. Thomas Ward, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Some Dude 267, Orange Glass, Joshua Long, Ohio Trucker 1, Royal Hudson 2860, Lord Hot 444, Arthur Roy, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitson 131-232, Mr. Black Rose, Master of None, Josh Johnson, Lock Kraken, Twin Fox, Dime Blade 17, Anzac A1, and Dozzy Wasn't. Till next time, this is Darkness, individual Von, farewell.